Now live from Fawcett Stadium in Canton, Ohio, the 91st meeting between the Canton McKinley Bulldogs and the Massillon Tigers. Welcome now to the press box. High above Fawcett Stadium, I'm Scott Davis, and with me, Perry Head football coach Keith Wakefield. First off the bat, Keith, congratulations on your season. Thank you, Federal Scott. League champs for the second year in a row. Must make you very happy. Yeah, we're very proud of our program. Our coaches and kids uh, uh, had a tremendous season as far as we're concerned, and to defend your title is tough in any sport anymore, and we're very proud of our program. Of course, this game is so very special for so many reasons. The tradition of it, the 91st meeting between the two teams. But there's some playoff implications as well. Before we look to the playoff implications of this ball game, let's turn back the clock to last night and show you some of the scores of the teams involved in the playoff hunt. We want to begin by congratulating both St. Thomas Aquinas and Canton Central Catholic, who qualify in their respective regions. This is the situation, though, in our region of Division I. The number one team is Canton McKinley. Of course, they're here today. Number two, Glen Oak over Canton South, 21-7. That guarantees Glen Oak a spot in postseason play. Number three, Walsh Jesuit over number eight, Barberton. That was a big ball game, and Walsh Jesuit is now qualified for a spot. So there are two of the four positions filled right there. Other action, Worcester had a chance if Maslin lost today to qualify. However, despite leading by a touchdown with two minutes to go, Orville came roaring back in a game played at Orville, and Orville wins a 28-20, knocking Worcester out of postseason play. Zanesville's hopes are still alive, a 21-0 win over Newark. The problem there is Newark had only two wins coming in, so Zanesville won't get many computer points. Zanesville finishes at 9-1, their only loss right here on this field to Kent McKinley earlier in the season, 20-16. Number seven, Jackson. They also had a chance for postseason play. However, Hoover ended those hopes 14-7 last night in North Canton. However, both teams had fine seasons, and congratulations to both head coaches, Ed Glass and Rick Campbell, both finishing at 7-3. And, and this could be the uh, uh, long-shot team. Nordonia beat Cuyahoga Falls 21-13. They're rated 10th this week, but only four points behind number six, Zanesville. And they beat a team, Cuyahoga Falls, head coach Keith Wakefield, that only had uh, three losses, now four, but they won six ball games. So what it boils down to is this, to try to simplify things. Kent McKinley is in the playoffs whether they win this game or lose, but they want to win it. It's a big one, a lot of tradition, and it's definitely a playoff atmosphere. The other teams, Glen Oak and Walsh Jesuit, have made it, so it looks like either Zanesville or Nordonia will capture that last spot if Maslin loses today, if Maslin wins their end. We're going to talk more about that, but first... Let's hear from these fine sponsors. Okay, we're back here at Fawcett Stadium. Head coach Keith Wakefield, you played the Tigers uh, one week ago from last night. You're also scrimmage McKinley. And, of course, you know both of these teams very well. We're going to show the folks at home some statistics, and as we do, we'll talk about the two teams. I know one thing offensively, both teams like to run with the football. Yeah, there's, there's no question that uh, I think both teams will come into the game to establish a running game. And yeah. as you see, uh, turnovers both protect the ball very well. Yeah, they haven't, uh, they've not beaten themselves this year. That's, that's a key point in this game. I think it, it'll boil down to kicking field position because of the wind and, and obviously the turnover ratio. Passing yardage is close, yet I give the Bulldogs a slight edge because of the experience of people like Brian Chaney, Juan Taylor, and Jerome Perrin. Yeah, you know, and I, I think Masson has the capabilities. There's no question about it. Sick and Taylor hasn't caught the ball as much as he has a year ago or Lechtovitz, but they're excellent receivers. And we get a chance to look at the defense. Really, the strength of both teams. Both have been very stingy, and, of course, I guess the only stat that really counts when you get down to that points allowed, you can't get much closer than that. Well, that's for certain. They're, uh, they're both good defensive football teams. Uh, McKinley relies a little more on quickness, I think, angling a little bit more than Masson, but... Uh, should be pretty even up front. Bulldogs uh, strong against the run and the Tigers strong against the pass. As you can see by those numbers, this is a per game average. Right, no question. Again, I think that uh, the big thing will be 
pressure on the quarterback by both defensive lines and, and the ability to get after him will, will, will help that statistic. If we throw all the statistics out the window, as they say you must do in a big ball game like this, what do you feel it's going to boil down to? Will it be a key play, a key turnover, what? Well, I think in any key game, especially this one, the emotions run high, there may be three or four plays in this game that may turn it either way. And the thing about it is you never know when they may come. And uh, the team that gives best effort and, and, and continues to play uh, will probably come out the victor. But there will be three or four key plays in this football game. They're introducing uh, members, the uh, senior members of the McKinley Band making their last uh, appearance on this field. And that is why uh, you're seeing that. And we're getting ready now for our national anthem. Actually, first the McKinley alma mater. they'll get in position for the national anthem. We saw band director Mike Ward of Kent McKinley, and we'll have both band shows for you at halftime. While they're getting into position, I would like to mention the referees while we have time. What a fine group of officials from the Youngstown area. Fred Vicarell, the referee. Manny Nunez, the umpire. Dutch Miller, the linesman. Jack Delushev will be the line judge. Uh, Dutch Miller, as we said, the linesman. And Mike Butch will be the back judge. Coach, you know these well from your these officials well from your experiences over in their neck of the woods. Total refereeing experience, 146 years. They have been doing this ball game in Massillon, and now because they've done it so well, they've been asked by the folks at Camp McKinley to referee it. That must be the ultimate compliment. And uh, those are the officials lined up. We're going to pause for some more fine words of interest, and then we'll be back with the opening kickoff. We're, look, we're looking for a crowd of about 20, 21,000. They sold about 21,000 tickets to this ball game. In fact, the only empty spaces that I can see, Coach, are to our right in the bleacher seat, seats. Other than that, it's just about a full house. The last time you were here, you told me, you were on the sidelines, an assistant coach for the Maslin Tigers. Set up that situation because it does have implications the way these two teams are today. Well, it was 1973, and I was assistant coach with Bob Cummings at Maslin. We came over here undefeated, leading the computer region. I had one tie, but we were 8-0-1. And, and McKinley had taken two losses that season and the two teams that we had beaten. And they beat us 21-0, and it wasn't really a close football game. So anything can happen in this game. To set up the playoff implications for you, quite simply in this ball game. McKinley has made the playoffs whether they win or lose, but it's an important game to win from this perspective. If they win and uh, win their first round playoff game, both the first and second round games would probably be held right here at Fawcett Stadium. They would have the home field advantage. Maslin must win for postseason play. If they don't, their season is over. So it's, uh, but it, I'm wondering, can John Moranto use that Keith Wakefield as an incentive where perhaps the Bulldogs cannot? No question, because uh, he must win if they plan to get in the playoffs. They have to feel that way, the way things have gone. So, you know, not just the rivalry of the Massimo McKinley game, but also playoffs. And that just adds to it. You see the color and pageantry. Both teams coming out in the field at the exact same moment. The balloons <laughs> are off. The colors are obvious. Orange and black for the Tigers and red and black and a few white balloons as well for McKinley. For the Bulldogs, the home team on the scoreboard, they're in uh, black jerseys, red pants with white trim and from Aslan, the visitors, the orange pants and the white tops with the black trim. 
Coach, set up uh, what happened. You kind of listen in. We have a mic on uh, Fred Vickerell, the official. Set us up in terms of the kickoff. Well, Masson won the toss and deferred the kick to the second half, which basically means that they will get their choice in the second half. Well, McKinley obviously wanted the ball then, so they elected to receive the football. Then Masson chose the goal, so in my opinion, it's to Masson's advantage. They got the wind in the first half, and they'll get the ball in the second half. This 1985 McKinley Maslin football game, sponsored in part by Remlinger Oldsmobile Cadillac Dodge, 7966 Hills and Dales Road in Maslin. By Best Products, where there's more fine jewelry for less. Don't forget us. Also brought to you in part by the Canton Area McDonald's and by Wakeham Auto Stores. George Wakeham is your friend of the factory in Stark County. There you see the officials at the 50 yard line. And we're just about set to go. And for the folks at home coach, that wind advantage is blowing from the right hand side of the screen to the left. And that will be the goal that the uh, Tigers will be defending. So if there's any advantage right off the bat, as you said, it belongs to Maslin. Now, of course, the one advantage to McKinley is they get first crack at the ball. I asked the two head coaches, I'll ask you, how important is it to be the first team to put points on the scoreboard in a game like this? Well, in a big game, there's no question. The momentum goes to the team that scores first. And I don't know how many times it, the team that has scored first has won this football game, but I'm sure it's a number. Deep for McKinley in the middle is number 33, Chris Clax. And ready to kick it off for Maslin will be number 31, Mike Norris. This, the 91st meeting between the Bulldogs and the Tigers, and we are set to go. It's a short kick, and it's gonna bounce out of bounds, and that'll give us time to tell you that this game telecast is being brought to you thanks to local advertising support and under authority granted a TV67 by the Canton City School System. Any use of the pictures, descriptions, or accounts of this broadcast without the express written permission of TV67 and the Canton City Schools is strictly prohibited. So we'll take it back and try it again. And what happens here, Coach, is that McKinley could end up with some real good field position. Yeah, they sure could. Norris is capable of kicking the ball deep. Uh, it almost looks like they're trying not to kick it to their deep people. Norris probably had his best game kicking against your ball club one week ago. Yeah, he sure did. Two field goals, the only two that he has on the season. And Maslin's 13-3 win. Jerome Perrin is on uh, the right side of Chris Clax. Jeff Richardson is at the top of the screen. Let's try it again. Good kick. Chris Clax will take it, fumble it, pick it up, fumble it again. Now has it at the 10 yard line to the 15, across the 20, and he is knocked down by guess who? The kicker, Mike Norris. Good coverage by the Masson people. Ball went to about the five yard line. They had great coverage to hold him inside the 30. We've got about a 60% chance of rain here. Skies are dark, but uh, no rain at this point after some rain this morning. We're going to take a look at the offensive backfield and coach what I can say about that, a veteran unit all the way around. They all played in this game in key roles one year ago. And say have a lot of Division I prospects, I should add. First play from scrimmage, off tackle, Percy Snow, good hole. And he'll be over the 25 to about the 27, running behind Terry Brewer and Mark Maley. That will bring up a second down and four following the gain of six. We're approaching the 11 minute mark. McKinley with the ball, second and four on their own 28. There's that offensive line. Averaging coach, uh, if you take away the tight end, Mike Smith, about 225 pounds. And as you said, led by Dean Brown, a definite Division I prospect at 253 pounds. Give to Clax over the right side this time, and he'll be right at the 30 yard line. This time Third running behind the other side of the line. And uh, on that line, Dean Brown that we just mentioned at guard, 253 senior. Craig Kent's 246 junior. They got some size, coach. They sure do. They're a big, big football team. That was a little wing, uh, little tailback counter with the guard and tackle leading through. Defensive line for the Tigers, as you see it there. Two good outside linebackers, and Feaster may be one of the key men for them on defense on that line. A big play, third and two, 10 minutes, 30 seconds to go. Roll out by Chaney, he slips, recovers. 
And I think because he slipped, he's going to be short. Didn't make it. He just slipped down behind the line of scrimmage. Looked like he lost his footing. I believe he got the first down. Be fourth down and one. Your right foot, man. The ball on the 32. And Rich Van Voris coming in, averaging 38.5 per kick. Back for the Tigers will be Wes Ziegenthaler and Bart Lekovitz. And as you can see, Bart is a starter in that defensive backfield for the Tigers. Good kick. Beauty. Ziegenthaler all the way back on his 21-yard line. Now giving ground, and he's tackled at the 20. Great coverage. Dave Williams among those down on the tackle. Along with Gar Brown, number 22. That was a great kick into the wind, Scott. Great kick. Yeah, keep in mind going into the wind. 9.46 to go. Maslin, their first offensive series. First and 10 with the ball on their 20-yard line. Okay, we're back, 9.42 to go, and the clock is now running first and 10 with the ball on the 20-yard line. Paul Fabianich, the quarterback, to the up man, Cornell Jackson, not much there. Three or four Bulldogs in on the tackle, including Gary Little and Jerome Perrin and Percy Snow. Yeah, they just basically came out in a double tight formation and ran the ball off tackle to the fullback. Here's the backfield, starting backfield, and uh, they were all seniors in that lineup as well. Sigenthaler, key man to watch. Yeah, they've got him a tailback. That's a new position for him today. All right, there's the uh, surprise that we were looking for. And to the air, the man was open, the ball overthrown. Lekovitz had first down yardage, defending on the play, Joe Hoskins, and there's the switch. Uh, we talked to head coach Moranto. He said, Scott, there are gonna be a few changes, a few surprises. He made one surprise in the game against St. Joe's earlier in the year, as you see the Maslin offensive line, by putting Ziegenthaler in a quarterback. And now Ziegenthaler, no question, probably their best athlete. And he has now played defensive back. He returns kicks and punts. He's played wide receiver, quarterback, and now tailback. He's a fine, fine football player. We're in a third and eight situation with the ball on the 22-yard line. And there's a draw play. Bully McKinley, but a great open field tackle. I think that was Larry Tharp. Percy Snow in there as well. Somebody grabbed him from around the ankles and really stopped any chance of a first down. There's the defensive line for Kent McKinley. Along with Dean Brown, you'll also see Williams, Dave Williams, number 24 in there. And linebackers, Percy Snow, coach. He's a definite Division I prospect. Great football player, no question. Size and ability. Certainly a good candidate for all county. This is Ken Hawkins. Low line drive kick that'll be fielded by Chris Clax. Excellent returner, watch out, he breaks two tackles and it'll be gang tackle, but he's into Tiger territory. They'll mark it at uh, between the 48 and 49 yard line of Maslin, best field position coach. That was a low punt, Clax was able to field it and get a good return. We're approaching the eight minute mark, first quarter, no score if you're just joining us. Fawcett Stadium. And the Bulldogs with the ball call it on the 48-yard line. Brian Chaney, the quarterback. Snow and Clax, the running backs. Second man through is Clax. Good block by Snow, and he'll get it down to about the 45-yard line. Just an isolation play off the left guard. Snow leading. Well, McKinley, no surprises. This is what they do best. Run with the football, run straight ahead. There's no question. Their offensive line is, is dominant-type football players, and they have two big backs that carry the football. Brian Cheney back to pass for the first time. The man is open. It's caught by Perrin, and he's run out of bounds inside the 35-yard line. Now first first down of the game, Coach. He's a fine athlete, isn't he? Oh, and what a game he had against St. Joe's. I thought he really came on as a receiver in that game because all the attention was on Juan Taylor, the Bulldogs' leading receiver, and uh, Brian Cheney has put together two solid games back-to-back. -back. He did this one year ago. He came on late in the season. He's developed, no question. Through the year, gotten better and better. Bulldogs now have it first down with the ball. Call it the 34-yard line. Give to Snow, and the Tigers ready for that one. 
They lined up in a strong backfield that time and led Clax and gave the ball to Snow in an isolation play. It looks like Masson was ready for it. Ogie Feaster. Myrick's in there, number 10, one of the defensive linemen. Call it a gain of one. Second down and nine. Percy Snow comes out of the lineup. No surprise, both teams will rotate four. In the case of Madison with Ziegenthaler back there, five backs at any given time. Right now it's Williams and Clax. Fake to Clax, ball in the air. Nice catch by Jerome Perrin. Same pattern as before, a little out route into the sideline. Great catch. Working on Myrick's number 10, who's the only sophomore starter out there. In fact, I believe he's the only sophomore starter for either team. Ziegenthaler had been playing that position. It's kind of hard to ask a young man to do everything. So they worked Myricks in. He's played well for the Tigers. Now Snow is back in. Williams is out. Third down and one call. Ball on the 26. We're at the six minute, 10 second mark, first quarter. Gets to Snow. Plenty of yardage for the first down. Down to around the 20 yard line. Same isolation. They just ran to the left side, Scott. Coach, the replay on this play, power football. Double down on the nose, Clax led through, and Snow picked up about four. Second first down in this drive that started on the Bulldogs' own 48. This is Clax, there's a hole, breaking into the secondary, and he's down to the six-yard line. That same tailback counter we saw earlier in the game. They pull the backside guard and tackle, and they lead around and through the hole. It's good football play out of the eye. What's one big difference between the Bulldogs uh, this year and at this time one year ago? The threat of both Snow and Clax. You can't concentrate on Chris Clax as you could have last year. Percy Snow has developed into an excellent running back, especially from the inside. We do have a timeout call by the Maslin Tigers. Timeout, 542 left in the first quarter. There's no score. First down and goal to goal for the McKinley Bulldogs with the ball on the six yard line. They've done this drive completely on the ground, running the ball for 42 yards. Coach, you're knocking on the door, and I, I don't think either team can afford missed opportunities like this. Gives the snow, slip one tackle, and he's in for the Kent McKinley touchdown. That's the same isolation play they've been running. Strong backs, clack sled, snow up through the middle. From ground level, Coach, take a look at the replay. Wilson misses him in the backfield. Look at their line come off the football. Tremendous surge by their offensive line. Make that touchdown number 14 now for Percy Snow. Mark Smith on to try the extra point. He is 19 out of 23 for the season. 20 out of 24. We've hit the 538 mark to go and our first score on the board, the Camp McKinley Bulldogs seven and the Maslin Tigers nothing. Well, Coach McKinley has done, you know, it's Maslin that likes to drive the ball early in their first or second possessions. We talked about it on the pregame show. McKinley traditionally has started slow, but in their last two games against Youngstown South, against St. Joe's, they did exactly this, score early. It's got to make Coach Tom McDaniels feel good. They're just basically lining up and running straight ahead football, coming right at them, and uh, I think they're a little bit bigger and a little more physical up front the way it looks right now at least. So McKinley, the early advantage, seven to nothing, and we're ready for the kickoff of Mark Smith. Yeah, kicks it along the ground, picked up by one of the up men, that's Derek Newman, and that is an excellent open field tackle by Mike Parrish, number 40, a 5'7", 140-pound junior. He may not be very big, but he made a big hit on that play. It was a great hit downfield. Tigers will set up shop at their own 34-yard line. 5.27 and the clock is running. First quarter, Kent McKinley 7, Maslin nothing. Tight formation, I backfield, only Letkovitz at the bottom of the screen. That's their primary target. He's open, he's got the ball, tackled by Joe Hoskins. 
But that's going to be Maslin's first first down of the ball game. Again, they're double tight with Sigenthal at tailback. Just threw a little out route to Lektovitz for the first down. Because I would assume when you when you look at a tight formation like that, everybody's thinking run, run, run. Again from ground level. A little dive action to the fullback to Jackson. There's the route to Lektovitz. Good catch. First and ten for the Tigers. Ball on the Maslin 46-yard line. And back to throw Fabianich. Pressure by Jerome Perrin. But now plenty of real estate for Paul Fabianich. Run out of bounds by Chris Clax, but that'll be a first down at the McKinley 38. He just dropped back the throw, saw nobody open, just tucked the ball and ran to the left, and all the McKinley defenders seemed to be to the other side of the field. Kind of came from the outside. That opened something right up the middle. I'm surprised that Maslin is, chooses to put the ball up in the air, and I think it's surprising the Bulldogs a little bit. I mean, here's a team that'll average somewhere in the area of 10 passes per game. <laughs> and, and the Kidley Maslin, you get used to surprises, though. Inside handoff to Jackson. He's still on his feet and finally brought down. Jackson, the linebacker, and up from the secondary, Alex Bates. McKinley had angled with the field that time, and Jackson made a nice stop. Yeah, they call it a gain of two, second down and eight with the ball on the 36-yard line. We're inside four minutes and 30 seconds to go in the first quarter. 7-0, the Bulldogs. Yeah, here we talk about defense, defense, low-scoring game. Both teams will be hard-pressed to move the ball, and guess what happens? Both moving it very well at this stage. That's Jackson again. Percy Snow has him, and what an excellent play by number 34. Again, they angled field, Scott, and uh, Snow fired the B-gap and made the tackle on the fullback in the backfield. And they had Ziggenthaler back in the at tailback on that play. They gave it to the up man. Cornell Jackson injured most of the season. What a difference he makes when he's healthy. I know a week ago we looked at him and he was bigger than most of our linemen. 6'3", six, six, 209, according to the program, could be even bigger. and He certainly has the size, the strength, and the speed. Double wideouts to the top of the screen. That's Lekovitz in the slot. Split backfield and Fabianich to throw. Break sideline. Great catch by Wes Sigenthaler. They were in a trips formation that time. They had three receivers to the right. Sigenthaler being the wide man. Threw an out to him. Another first down for the Tigers. We approach the three-minute mark, and the ball now on the McKinley 25-yard line. Third first down of the drive, according to our statistician, Mark Anzetta. Again, Fabianich back to throw again. Going deep and slightly overthrown, but coach, the man was covered down there. Tight end, Agater. It's good coverage by Alex Bates. Manuel. That was just a bootleg, and they drug the tight end across the field, and that's who he was trying to go to. Neither team is known for throwing to their tight ends. Agater has only one pass reception in nine games. I think that just shows you what this game brings out. Uh, they're going to do some different things, some things that, that aren't expected. Chris, keep in mind, Maslin did not have a tight end. While Mike Currents was here, this is John Maranto's first year, and he's gone to the tight end set and away from the full three-man backfield with the wing. Baby on it again. The pressure by Perrin. He gets rid of it short, and Norris can't hold on. Credit a lot of that to the pressure of Jerome Perrin. Great pressure from the outside. He came from a weak side end position and pressured the quarterback immediately. Third down. May be hard to say, but Third Jerome down. Perrin uh, was dominant in this ball game one year ago. This year. Watch it here from the top of your screen, number seven. You can see Perrin coming from the left side. Hits Fabianis just as he gets rid of the football. Norris couldn't quite hang on. That's going to bring up a third down and ten with the ball on the 25-yard line. Big play for the Tigers inside McKinley territory. Again, Perrin on the pressure. Fabianich gets away. Chance to throw it now. Man is wide open. He holds onto the ball. That's Newman, the running back, tackled by Chris Platts. Again, Perrin had great pressure. He just stepped up and avoided it. Here you'll see it. He beats Hostetter to the outside and just misses him. Steps up in the pocket like you're supposed to do. 
This is a great throw, really, under pressure. Great catch by Newman. There's no question in my mind, this is Paul Fabianich's finest hour. And if you're going to have a finest hour, this is the game to do it in. That's first down and goal. The ball on the McKinley 9, 2 minutes, 30 seconds left in the first quarter. Inside handoff, big hole. That's Mike Norris. It was an isolation out of the eye off the right guard. They doubled down on the nose, man, led the fullback. Good run by Norris. Keep in mind, both teams with excellent defenses, averaging giving up only 9 or 10 points a game. We're approaching the end of the first quarter, and both teams could end up with 7 points on the scoreboard. It's been a great football game to this point. Both teams moved the ball. Late addition now for Massel and Agater in a tight end. Only wide out is Letkovitz to the top of the screen. They're throwing for it. Open touchdown, Massel into Derek Newman. I'm not sure where Newman lined up on that, whether he was up at the tight end or the back out of the backfield. It was a good play action pass. Excellent. Let's find out on the replay. They line up in strong back. <laughs> Another one of those uh, changes that head coach John Maranto puts in for this game, although I think you saw a little of it last week from a little different formation. Exactly. The wing. Moved, they have played him at that position before a little bit, yeah, no question about it. Great play action fake, though. Here's one of the problems uh, uh, that Maslin's had on their extra points. Norris, the fullback, having to quick change shoes. Let's see if they can get the extra point through, and they don't. And we talked about the kicking game and the possibilities there. Yeah, that, that could prove a very costly point. We have an official timeout on the field. 146 left to go first quarter. McKinley 7, Massillon 6. Okay, Paul Fabianich, four completions now out of seven attempts. Four out of seven. And like I say, there are games when he doesn't throw the ball much more than that. And I know he's, he's catching McKinley by surprise. He's catching us by surprise. Well, I think in a game like this, when, uh, when it means so much to both teams, that uh, that's what's going to happen. They're going to come in and do some different things, and they're going to do whatever it takes to win this football game. And again, throwing to their running backs. That has not been a, a, a great feature. I know I can remember one play when they got the ball to Harris. Uh, in your ball game. Let's go back one more time to the touchdown play. Now they're in a double tight formation with strong backs to the right. He fakes to Jackson. There's the touchdown to That's Newman. Right. Just a little dump pass we call it over the middle. It's tough to cover on the goal line with that play action fake. Uh, we got a barn burner here. Now that missed extra point could be a factor. And again the problem is Norris being in there in the backfield having to run off to the sideline, change his shoe, get on and quick kick, kick that extra point. Been a problem Maslin's had. Head coach John Moranto admitting that to us on the Maslin show last Wednesday night. Doesn't have any trouble with the kickoff, so another excellent kick. Chris Clax and Jerome Perrin. Clax with the ball now across the 10 to the 20 and down. That's great coverage, Scott. Again, holding them inside the 25 yard line. Wenzel, number 45, a senior, 5'8, 156 among those down on the tackle. And the officials say start that clock, 138, 7 to 6 now. McKinley leads. This is my type of game, Coach. I love the offense. I love the scoring. <laughs> <laughs> to the up man, Snow. Great initial hit by Dwayne Crenshaw. But Snow still moves forward and gets some yardage out of it. Just a dive play over the left guard. Gave the ball to Snow. Quick hitter. Crenshaw story in itself. Starting fullback in this ball game a year ago, asked by Coach Moranto, because he was such a good athlete to play defense, it's paid off. I think he's as fine a football player as that, that we played against this year, no question about it. He's a great defensive lineman, just a, a great kid. Coach Moranto's defensive player of the week from your ball game, so that speaks highly of that. Now the pitch is to Clax with Snow out in front, and again, good defense by the Tigers. That's Hoagie Feaster among those in on the tackle. That was a great play by Feaster. He's a fine defensive end. He strung the sweep out and eventually made the tackle. It's going to bring up a third and six with the ball on the 26-yard line. Eddie Mullally is coming in. And they're going to a three wideout situation. And they're putting Taylor 
almost at a tight end, and that's the first time I've seen that in a while. Back to throw is Cheney. Over the middle, Taylor's got it, breaks the tackle. And he goes ahead for the first down yardage. He was close when he caught the ball, and he saw the marker and fell ahead to get that first down. An unusual formation there, Coach, uh, putting Taylor in the slot. Usually it's Perrin. Perrin lined up on the outside. We Let's haven't take a seen look. him at the tight end. They bring him right, right across the middle, just a little hook. Little hooker out about six yards, and he makes a great effort to get the first down. What did Coach McDaniel say? Uh, if you're saving any secrets, this is the ball game <laughs> to reveal them. And that's the end of the first quarter of action, and we've seen plenty of it. The score, Kent McKinley 7 and Massillon 6. We're back here at Fawcett Stadium. Here's truly Scott Davis, along with Perry High Hutt football coach Keith Wakefield. Mark and Zetta doing the stats for us. And Mike Larson keeping us all in line here in the booth. First and 10. Ball on the 35-yard line. What a great individual effort by linebacker Jared Vance. McKinley had come out in an unbalanced formation. That's the first time we've seen that in the game. He tried to run the ball off tackle to that side. Vance made a nice hit. Good tackle. Okay, the officials stepping in. A little emotion shown in this game. All right, not only is Perrin back in for Gar Brown, but the first opportunity to see number 20, Benny Anthony. What a great job he's done. Clack's now starting both offensively and defensively due to the injury to Tom Donahue. And Anthony stepped in and rushed for 274 yards. Back to throw, Brian Chaney over the middle, open. And down. All right, good play. Get up and go where you belong, gentlemen. And guess who? Benny Anthony. Making his presence felt immediately. Yeah, they're going to call it a gain of uh, call it a gain of five because they lost yardage on the last play. There's the sidelines and head coach Tom McDaniel's, Chris Clax number 33, Eddie Mullally number 19 to either side. Third down and six. Ball on the 39-yard line. Ten minutes, 30 seconds to go before the half. Seven-six McKinley. Back to throw Cheney, he slips, he recovers, he throws. The ball is tipped, and Jared Vance almost had an interception. They had Taylor again at the tight end. I think they're trying to throw that little hook route that they mm -hmm. did earlier for the first I, down. Frankly, I think the whole play got messed up with the slip. I think the timing. Exactly. You're the head coach. You, you can tell me that better than... Well, they pressured him a little bit, and uh, they held the tight end up so he couldn't get out as easy, and that, that does throw it off. Second slip we've seen. Some heavy rains overnight. Keep your fingers crossed, though. Decent weather up to this point. Temperature around 60 degrees. Here's Rich Van Voris. He launched a 46-yarder his first time. And another excellent kick, this time with the win. Ziggenthaler all the way back to his 10-yard line. Up to the 15. He's explosive and caught from behind. And that's Mike Scipione, number 55, who's the snapper on the punt. Nice Mas play. Maslin had a good wall set, too. Good thing he made the stop. He might have went somewhere. Call that a gain of almost 17 yards. And another excellent punt by Rich Van Voris. 51 yards. Coach, he's kicking well. He's averaging about 48 yards on his two punts. It's a game of field position. Let's see what the Tigers can do now in their third possession. And off to the deep man, Ziggenthaler, in our first flag. Motion penalty on Masson. We've got uh, Fred Vickerell mic'd here, and we're both the coach and I are listening in. Let's go. Second and seven or first and 15. Percy, who's the defensive captain, Percy Snow, he wants the yardage. Good choice in this situation. Back him up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Thank Fred you. Vickerell. Illegal motion, white, still first down. Number one. Number one. Tailback moved a little bit early. That's what the call was. Keep in mind, that's a brand new position, at least in game situations, for Wes Ziggenthaler. This time with only a single back, a couple of wide outs. Over the, ooh, over the middle, and Gary Little, number 37, didn't see the ball, or he may have picked it up. 
It was a little out to Newman from the tight end position, and I don't think Derek was ready for the ball. They flooded that area with both Letkovitz and Newman on that play. And I can count on the fingers of one hand the games I've been to where Maslin has had only one running back. So this is the formations, as you said, that have really certainly surprised me. Now here's Ziggenthaler, tailback again. Letkovitz to the bottom of the screen. Back to throw. Here's Jerome Perrin. Again, right up the middle, Fabianich, and he gets some yardage. Still going to be third and long. Back to the original line of scrimmage. Looked like that was going to be a swing pass to Sigenthaler out of the backfield. He swung <laughs> left, and it's very possible that's what they were trying to set up. Let's face it, if Wes Ziggenthaler is the best athlete on the Tigers team, they've got to try to figure out how to get the ball to him. Let's see it on the replay. Watch Jerome Perrin, number seven. I believe you see him going up to the top of the screen. I believe that's what it was. Can't tell for sure, though. It's Kerry Brown, the nose man, and Percy Snow in on the tackle. Third down and 10. Ball on the 27-yard line. Nine minutes to go before the half. A pitch out now to Jackson. And he's still on his feet, but he'll be short of the first down. Down at the 30. Just a little quick pitch. We call it 18 and 19. Just turn and pitch the ball. They pull the tackle to lead for him. And yeah, he saw the strength of Jackson. Dave Williams, Percy Snow. Here it is. They're pulling the tackle hospital to get the block on the defensive end parent. Jackson's fighting for yardage. Well, right, look at Percy. He had the initial contact, shook him off, and Percy got up and was in on the tackle. Ken Hawkins, number 83, in for the Tigers. Oh, 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 pressure from the Bulldogs. A low line drive kick, but good coverage by the Tigers. And he'll down the ball at about the 28, between the 27 and 28 yard line. It's Todd Purdue, the starting linebacker, number 55, who downed the ball. And they'll take over on the 28 yard line. Well, I'm surprised they've punted the ball as well as they have into the wind. I really am. I know what a factor it was last night in our game. They've yeah. really done a good job of punting the football. Look, look at the American flag, straight out. Again, the wind blowing from the right to the left-hand side of your screens at home. Power football straight up the middle. Again, McKinley was in an unbalanced formation to the wide side of the field. It looked like they ran a, a trap play to the fullback inside. And that's 24, David Williams. That's his first carry. David Williams, 24. Percy Snow, 34, the two fullbacks. Jerome Perrin in with the play. Gar Brown is out. Another strength of McKinley, their depth. Excellent personnel. Too deep at literally every skill position on offense. Pitch back to Clack. Blocked by Brewer, but good pursuit by the Tigers. It's hard to call out who makes the tackle, Coach, and there's about half a dozen Tigers in there. Matt Swank is getting up. 18, Vance in there as well. Great team tackling by Maslin. Again, McKinley was in that unbalanced formation, and Maslin shifted their defense over one man. They ran to the ball real well. It was just a pitch sweep. Yeah, Maslin making that adjustment. Now Gar Brown and Percy Snow coming in. Perrin and Williams will leave. Looks like a passing situation here. Third and seven with the ball on the 31-yard line. Under seven minutes to go now before half. 7-6 McKinley. Oh, a little shovel pass. Boy, that was almost disaster. The good thing about that, though, it is a pass. If the ball's on the ground, it's not a fumble. It is a pass. Excellent comment, so. Yeah, that was an excellent defensive series, too, by Maslin. Turning into more of a defensive game now. Yeah, I, do I get the feeling both teams making those adjustments now to these changes as they came out of the locker room? Exactly. Playing Van good defense, both football teams. Now this is more of a line drive kick, and Ziggenthaler will grab it on his 30. Started one direction, now he's in trouble, and down by Gar Brown at the 30-yard line. We're going to pause, 6.33 to go, 7-6 to six, McKinley. Joe Tavisi stopping by to say hello. We want to thank Joe and all the folks here at the Canton City School Systems for their cooperation. They've been a great host here to us at Fawcett Stadium. We're back to the action now. Inside 6.30 now and first and 10 for the Tigers. 
with the ball on their own 30-yard line. The I formation, Fabianich back to throw. Over the middle, ball is, looked like it was tipped and then caught. It was a middle screen to Sigenthaler. They faked to him on a sprint draw and he came over the middle and uh, Snow played it perfectly. Quentin Jackson uh, was in the vicinity. From ground you'll, level. Yeah, you'll see the fake here. See, they fake the signal Taylor. He comes through at the middle screen. Good football play. You'll see Snow right there. He and Taylor. Good defense by McKinley. Well, here's a tight formation. You would think run. And it is to Ziegenthaler on a pitch back. Good blocking. And they get about five out of it. Yeah, we haven't seen that yet. It's been a, there's a double tight end, tight wing, and a pitch sweep to Ziegenthaler into the short side of the field. McKinley is basically a strong safety to the field football team, and they're trying to run away from him. Norris is out, and Lekovic is in. So they had three running backs in, counting Ziegenthaler on that play. Now Lekovic wide to the bottom of the screen. I formation, everyone else in tight. Fabianich to throw. Going deep for Lekovic. Ball is in. No, let's see, no. Almost intercepted by Joe Hoskins. Great coverage. Great coverage. Oh, he recovered well. I don't know how many people know the Joe Hoskins story. He was in the junior high program, the Kansas City School System, and then he decided to go out and make some money, uh, you know, working fast food restaurant, and he left the program. He decided as a senior to come back and try out for the team, and McDaniel says, okay, we'll give you a shot. They did. He's a starter. Very glad he's back tonight. That's right. From the 20. Short a man. Partially blocked. Williams and Perrin in on it. They only had 10 people on the field. They were short one of their up backs. That's where the guy came through. Well, how about that? McKinley takes advantage of it. McKinley takes advantage of it. Ball on their own 46-yard line, and now the McKinley fans get into it. Four minutes, 55 seconds to go, and let's see if the Bulldogs can capitalize. And we're going to have an official timeout. Timeout, 4.55 to go, 7-6, to six, McKinley. Yeah. On the 46-yard line, Another angle on that punt. We'll talk about it in a minute, but right now Chris Clax with the ball. Flips a couple tackles, and he'll be up around midfield. On that punt, 19 yards. However, did you see, folks, where the ball was rolling on the ground? That Coach Keith Wakefield tells me, and listening to the officials, that was a free ball. Yeah, what had happened? It hit one of the McKinley players, but I don't think the officials saw it, and neither did the Maston players, so the ball rolled dead. Could have been a big, big play. Boy, I'll tell you. I'm going to remember that play. A partial block, the free ball. McKinley with the excellent field position. Second and seven. Call it right at midfield. Backs are in the eye. Two wideouts to either side. Give to the deep back. Clax and nothing doing. That's Mark Harder, number 76. Crenshaw forced that. He filled the backfield and almost made the tackle about four yards deep. And then Harder made a great hit. Now Maslin is doing an excellent job now, shutting down that McKinley running game. There you see head coach John Moranto along the sidelines. And we're looking at a probable passing situation with third and eight, although you learn in this game there's nothing probable. Anything can happen and probably will. Juan Taylor will come wide to the bottom of the screen. Double wing formation. Pitch back to Snow. They're running out of it. They're going to get the first down. what I tell you? We haven't seen that formation either today. And again, Maslin, I'm sure, looking for the pass. They had two receivers to the field, and they went to a tight wing to the sideline. And again, pitch the ball. Here it is. And again, Maslin also is a strong safety team to the field, basically. And they're running away from the strong in that situation. Dave Williams in with the play. And Chris Clax will go out. Here's something else new. Both of their fullbacks are in the same backfield now. And actually, now they'll line up in a split backfield. Perrin on the wing. The give is to Snow. Inside slips one tackle, slips two tackles, and is down at the 35-yard line. Call it a gain of six. That isolation again. Off the right guard. Doubling the nose man and leading the tailback through. 
Snow's a big back to bring down. Certainly one of their most valuable players, definitely a Division I prospect. Probably one of the best players in the county overall. There's no doubt about it. Potentially a great one. Second and four, Taylor wide to the bottom of the screen, Perrin on the wing to give. Benny Anthony. Benny Anthony back in there, tailback with Snow. As the up man, you see Percy Snow going back to the huddle. Third and about a yard, Chris Claxton with the play. Just a little isolation out of the eye now this time with the tailback carrying the ball. Snow leads and Anthony with the football. Crenshaw and Harder among those in on the stop. Third and one, 2.15 to go before halftime. The fumble. Chaney recovers the fumble, but uh, and I think McKinley will want a timeout to see where they go from here because they're going to be facing a fourth and four on the 35. Looked like he just mishandled the snap coming out. Couldn't tell for sure, but that's what it looked like. Well, they got the ball, but it was still a costly, costly play. Here's the McKinley sideline. And we're going to pause. 158 to go. 7 to 6 McKinley. Fawcett Stadium in a key play here. Fourth and four. 158 to go. Fans on both sides now. Supporting their team. Look at this formation. Full house backfield. The fake is to Snow. Wide open is. Oh, wide open is Perrin, and the ball was overthrown. They were in a power eye right, we call that. And uh, they faked off tackle. Perrin ran a little out route. It was wide open. Wide open. Another formation that I haven't seen. I think I've been down here to watch the Bulldogs play six or seven times. And from a full house backfield, they throw the football. And that's see what the Tigers can do. 154 to go. First and 10. Ball at the McKinley 35. Two wide outs. Two tight ends, and they give it to the lone running back, Jackson. What an excellent tackle by guess who? Percy Snow. They were double tight, double wide, and they ran the trap to Jackson. Snow made a great play. Second and ten, no gain on that play. And by the time this next snap comes off, we'll be inside a minute 30. Kim McKinley leading it, seven to six. Both teams with a touchdown. McKinley leads on a successful extra point by Mark Smith. Again, it's the running play, and again, McKinley has it pretty well defended. They'll pick up a few yards, though. Looks like about five yards to go. Jerome Perrin among those on the bottom of that tackle. Ziggenthaler will bring in the play. Here it is, Coach. Little pitch iso, we call it. Pitched the ball and they're running off the left guard. And actually, it was Percy Snow that initially knocked him off, the, off his feet, and Perrin applied the finishing touches. This is a third and more like seven call. And it's a draw play to Jackson. Percy Snow, and it looks like Jerry Williams, number 78, stopped that one, and it looked like they had first down yardage. He did. Snow made a great tackle. He's all over the field today. If those two don't tackle, let's watch it again. If those two don't make the tackle, he's got the first down and more. The draw to Jackson. They've got to block well. Snow comes off a block is what happens. And it's actually Percy. You, you saw the reaction of one of the masculine linemen, Tony Lambert. said, oh, I thought we had that one. We are live here at Fawcett Stadium in Canton, Ohio, with 28 seconds to go. McKinley called that timeout. The fourth and four play with the ball on the 41. Now, what do you do here, coach? Let's put you in the Maslin side. Take well, it away, or? Yeah, they're going to punt the football, no question. The thing about it, I know McKinley feels they're going to get some good field position. It's not a good return because of the win. Because they may try for another block, too. They've already partially blocked one punt that went for 19 yards. Well, I'm sure Maslin will have 11 people on the field this time. No question. Hawkins, the punter, is in there. Obviously, you don't want to take a chance on a fourth and four when you're on your side of the field. And you're only trailing by one. Yeah, 
A lot of surprises, a lot of new formations, a few people in new positions. And after both teams scoring early, it's now down to a defensive battle. Hawkins, little pressure, low kick. Clack with a chance for a return. Come bottom of the screen, watch out, and a, again, a good open field tackle. There's only one tackle Mike between Wilson. he and the goal line. He doesn't make the hit. Mike Wilson, number 21. Excellent return, people. We haven't had a chance to mention it. Clacks from McKinley, Ziegenthaler from Masson, two, two of the best. Here you see the coverage by Masson coming down. Good coverage there. Clacks almost breaks it. All right, Cheney's up at the line of scrimmage now. He'll go back about 10 seconds to go. Short one to Taylor. Needs to get out of bounds and does with two seconds to go. We're just going to try to get the ball out of bounds, stop the clock, maybe take one to throw it deep. It'll have to be now. It'll have to be uh, the old Hail Mary. Uh, and hope for uh, neither a touchdown or a penalty. Remember, the half cannot end on a defensive foul. Let's we'll see what they're going to do here. The ball on their own 46, between the 46 and 47 yard line, and two seconds to go. And that's what they're going to do. Looks like the Hail Mary clacks, Perrin and Taylor all to the top of the screen. There you see it. Lone running back Dave Williams. He'll stay in the block. And the pass is deep. Oh, tipped around, and uh, Taylor almost had a chance to come up with it. But that is the end of the first half of play with the score. Kent McKinley, seven, and Massillon, six. Time to score the Bulldogs seven, the Tigers six. You're listening to the Massillon Tigers swing band under the direction of Richard Tissett. Coach, let's take a look now at the halftime stats as you heard five foot two guys of blue. Stands for team. Pretty even, reflects the score. I think the real key though is the missed extra point. Oh boy, that, that could loom very, very big as the game goes because 
the new rules, obviously, of overtime and tied score changes your strategy towards the end of the game as far as going for a tie or, or not. But that obviously is out now. And, of course, no turnovers in terms of turnovers lost. I think that's tremendous in the game, this emotion, because that does happen on occasion. Well, let's go back now to the Maslin Band. Coming up, St. Elmo's Fire. Maslin Tigers swing band under the direction of Richard Tissett. We're at halftime. The score, Kent McKinley 7 and Maslin 6. This is the 1985 McKinley Senior 100. Mike Ward, the director, the music, rhythm of the night.
Well, that was the strong rhythm of the night. And now a featured twirler Holly Domer and the band performing a precision drill to the music Caribbean Queen. Well, now featuring John Homan on drums, percussion section featured, this is Axel F. Senior 100 band under the direction of Mike Ward. We're getting ready for third quarter action. The score, Kent McKinley 7 and Massillon 6.
Not only is Stark County the hotbed of high school football, it's also the home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And what great tradition, not only on the pro level, but also on the high school level right here in Stark County. And we're proud to be a part of it. We're getting ready for second half action. The score, Kent McKinley 7 and Massillon 6. Head coach Keith Wakefield, your impressions of that first half. Well, I think it started out, both teams moving the ball very well, trying some new things. I think uh, Maslin definitely came here to throw the football more than they had in previous games. I think that helped them move the ball, obviously. By the first downs, uh, both teams only have one first down rushing. The others are all by the pass. So it's definitely, you know, been a change, I think, in strategy a little bit. And I think, too, uh, another key factor involved, the lack of of turnovers yes uh, i know mckinley fumbled the snap there on that uh, key third down play but it's speculation what they could have done with it but the number of penalties not only a credit to both teams but to the officials of this ball game led by fred vicarell the fact that first half if you remember on the opening kickoff uh maslin kicked the ball out of bounds he got a five yard penalty another time the new kid in the offensive backfield ziggenthaler in motion maslin Two penalties for only 10 yards. McKinley doesn't have a penalty. I think that's a credit to everyone involved in this game. Well, they're two well-coached football teams. Uh, those guys prepare well. They have, a, they have an excellent staff and good quality football players. And there's no question officiating's been good. I, I think too often uh, officials try to control the game, but they're letting the kids play today. Both teams now coming out onto the field will be delayed slightly before we start the third quarter. An outstanding halftime show by both bands. Doesn't surprise me. There's as much tradition in these bands as there are into the uh, players themselves. And as you see, both teams warming up. Based on what you've seen first half, can we make some expectations of what to look for second half? Obviously, both teams feel that not only do you have to run the ball to win in a big game like this, you have to pass it as well. I think, you know, field position can still play a big part in this game. Uh, obviously, from looking at the stats, uh, McKinley had the best of that as far as punting was concerned. Average about 45 yards, where Masson averaged around 32 or 3. So that, that may play a bigger part in the second half than it even did in the first, because the wind's still coming directly right to left from the east, and that may, that may be a big difference. And the kicking game in general, not only the punting, Rich Van Voris outstanding with that 45-yard average, but also that extra point. And, and I don't want to keep harping on it, yet that's really the only tangible difference I've seen in both these teams in the first half. I've been, I've been real impressed the way Masson stopped McKinley's running game. Uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, up front, if you match people for people, McKinley's just size and, and dominance, I thought, would take over, as it showed in that first drive. But Maslin has made some adjustments, and they've played good, hard, physical defense. And uh, yeah, there's no question. It's, I think it's going to be a physical game this half, just like it was the first. Making those adjustments. Uh, I've heard that term time and time again. McKinley does it very well. Maslin has shown they can do it as well from a coaching perspective. Making those adjustments. Is that something that continues, you know, third quarter as well? I think they've gone in at halftime, and... There's, there are people who have come down from the box and they've said, well, they've done this, this, and this, and we, we have to look at these plays. We have to change this defensively a little bit. And Those are areas that, that obviously they want to work for. All right, let's get ready. We'll get settled in here for the third quarter. We'll be watching for those adjustments because I, I don't know how many more surprises each team can throw out there. No, they've, they've shown some formations and some things that obviously they haven't shown to date. Now let's hope the man upstairs will shine on us just a little bit longer. One more half. No rain for this time of year. Mild temperatures up in the uh, mid to upper 50s, we would guess. And uh, really, the weather's cooperating. Let's just keep our fingers crossed for one more half. There's head coach John Maranto in his first game, although 11 years at the helm up in Michigan, up in the Detroit area. I'm sure, though, he's never been through anything like this, coach. No, I tell you, it's a different situation. It really is. There aren't too many places in this country that it means as much as it does here. And the opposite side, head coach Tom McDaniels looking to even his record against the Tigers at 2-2. Two and two. And he'll be making his first appearance as a head coach in postseason play. One more reference, McKinley in the playoffs, but a win today gives them home field advantage. Maslin, if they win, they're in. And if they lose... Well, the season is over for the Maslin Tigers. We're ready to go. Mark Smith tees it up. And the second half of this ball game is underway. Again, a low kick.
kick. This is Jerome Myricks, number 10, from the 10-yard line. He's got a hole, and he gets good yardage up to the 32-yard line. That's a 22-yard return, and it gives Maslin decent field position to start the first drive of the second half. Let's take a look at the lineups as they come out. Paul Fabianich will be at quarterback. You see Bart Lekovitz will be going to the top of your screen. Watch this return, coach. Well, he bobbled it here. Sometimes that has an effect on the defense. They tend to run past him. Let's go back to live action now. The give is to Cornell Jackson. He's corralled by Percy Snow and by Gary Little. Snow's played a heck of a football game to this point. I'll tell you, he's both. in on almost every tackle. And on both sides of the light of scrimmage. If you have a color set, there's no point in me telling you who are the McKinley fans, who are the Maslin fans. You can see them for yourself. This is about as colorful a crowd as you'll want to see. And we're looking at somewhere in the area of 20 to 21,000 people here. Back to the field now. Gain of one, second and nine. Ball on the 33-yard line. 11 minutes to go third quarter. McKinley with a one-point lead. Give us to Jackson. Good hole. Breaks into the secondary. And finally corralled by Alex Bates, but that's going to be enough yardage for a first down. They've changed again, Scott. Uh, they have Sigenthaler at the left end now. They have Norris at uh, fullback and Jackson at tailback, so we're getting a little bit of what we've seen in the past. Sigenthaler's lined up at the left end. He's blocking. It's a sprint draw, we call it, to Jackson, and uh, he breaks it back against the grain and makes good yardage. And then we talked about how valuable it is to have Cornell Jackson back in the lineup after he missed more than half of the season due to a knee injury. And the up back this time is Norris and he's going to be corralled. Percy Snow. Tom Whitfield was at nose there, angled left and really made a nice play too. Got in on the hit. Tom Whitfield in at that nose guard position. Kerry Brown has started but Tom has seen plenty of action. And Tom Whitfield is a former Maslin Tiger. I wonder what this game means to him, having the chance to play in it. Okay, they've got Lekovitz on her wing, and he'll be in motion coming to the bottom of the screen. McKinley adjusts the fake to Norris, going back and down. Looks like Quentin Jackson. It is, number 29 at linebacker. He came through. Blitz from his right linebacker spot, and uh, by the time the quarterback turned around, he was sacked. Now, we've had pressure on the quarterback on a couple of occasions. This could be the first sack of the ball game. If memory serves. We know this much. Yes, it is, according to Mark. Is that a third down and 20? We do know it was a uh, loss of almost 10 yards. They lost a little bit on that last running play. Big call here. Tight formation, they'll keep it on the ground. McKinley stringing it out. They'll be well short of the first down, and that was my indication, Coach, from the Masson sidelines that they're not going to uh, give up a costly turnover there. I don't think they expected to get a first down there, but they didn't want to lose the football in a long pass. Exactly. Well, that surprised me a little, I guess, because they do have the wind to their back, and, and if they are going to throw it, I think it has to be in this quarter. Could be a big opportunity now for Ken Hawkins with that wind at his back to get off a long one. Got Alex Bates and Chris Clax back deep. Good snap. Kick is away. It's a line drive kick, although good distance, and Clax fields the ball on his 20. He's up to the 25, slips the tackle, and give him a return of 10, and the ball will be at the 30-yard line, where McKinley will get the ball on offense for the first time in the third quarter. An official timeout on the field, 8.25 to go, third quarter, McKinley 7, Massillon 6. The fans making their presence felt from the McKinley side. Let's go pups from the Massillon side. The call for defense, first and 10, ball on the 30, approaching the 8-minute mark. Give to the deep back, and he is snowed under. Benny Anthony with the ball. Mike Wilson, Matt Swank. Both teams playing super against the run. They really, really dominated the upfront play, both defensives. Jared Vance and Dwayne Crenshaw. That was at all on that carry. It's just a off tackle play, direct handoff. They pull the backside guard through and try to kick out with a fullback, and Masson stuffs it. Mark Great Carter. Defense. 
That was Mark Carter, number 76, with the initial hit. Massam playing very well defensively. Pitch back to Snow. There's a hole there, but it's quickly filled by the deep back, Jerome Myricks, the corner man. Boy, Maslin has just shut down McKinley's running game. We saw that, that formation in the first half, and they pitched, pitched the ball to Snow as they did there, and they just played great defense. Again, they're running to the football, getting to the ball. Now, what they're doing is setting up a passing situation, but first the replay. Maslin's angled away, too. That should be in McKinley's favor. That's Myricks, makes a great hit right there. Jared Vance comes in to help out. Seven minutes to go now, and Cheney back to pass on third and seven. The ball is thrown. Taylor was open, but he slipped and fell. They had double coverage on Taylor that time. They brought Feaster out from an end position, what we call an end off, and they had him covered with two people. Good pass. I think it could have gotten between him if he hadn't slipped and uh, fallen down. I believe it had caught her if he hadn't fallen. Now the key is Van Voris. Keep in mind, he's kicking into the wind. He's done an outstanding job. This is his fourth punt of the day. Sickenthaler and Letkovitz back deep. And a pretty good effort uh, against the wind. And it's bouncing almost sideways. Now it's starting to roll toward McKinley's favor. Good coverage, and it'll be down at about the 35-yard line, 34-35-yard line, where the Tigers take over. Thirty-two yard punt, which is not bad with that wind. No, it's tremendous. Like I said, they've done a real good job of kicking it into the wind. Both teams have the ball offensively once in this third quarter. Neither can do much with it. We're down to the 630 mark. Let's see what Maslin can do from their own 35. The pitch back. The long ball downfield. It's underthrown. He had it beat too. The ball was just underthrown. And Fabianich is down and he could be hurt. Now he's getting up. I don't know if he's injured or disappointed. I don't know if that's physical pain or mental pain. Uh, Probably a out. little of both. Let's see. Let's see it now. Hand off to the tailback. He pitches right back. It's a good legal hit. Also Just credits, under throw. Credit some pressure, too, on the part of Camp McKinley there. Well, <laughs> another, I would call it trick play, but another special play out of the Masson playbook. Now they go back to the more traditional power football that they're known for. That's that sprint draw we had seen earlier. He tried to cut it back to the right, and Kinley stopped it. Jackson on the carry. He'll pick up four, bringing up third and six with the ball on the Tigers' 38-yard line. Definitely imaginative play calling on both sidelines. Pulling out all the stops in this one, and why not? Third and six. Davionich back to throw. Wide open, and he drops the football. Like your classic example of trying to run before you catch it? We call that 44-5 uh, and five pass our offense, and they ran both receivers off, and the tailback came out of the backfield, and he's wide open. Wide open. So Maslin will be forced to punt again. Remember Hawkins with a win at his back. 5.47 to go. Kent McKinley 7 and Maslin 6. Good punt. Could be his best of the day. Clax goes back and touched him. Let's see what the call will be now. It's a loose football, is it not? Touchback? Must not have touched the ball. Must Boy. not have, yeah. The official's ruling like it's a touchback. Did. Come out to the 20. He must have known that because he didn't hustle after. No, he didn't, and I think he had to know that. Let's hope we have that one on a replay. We can take a look at it and see. Keep in mind, folks, we're up in the press box here, so our, we have a good side of the total field, but not specifically. And as we pick it up, the ball's already gone by, so it's hard to tell, but uh, obviously he knew it, and he decided just to let it go in the end zone. A lot of fans, though, you can oh. hear it. They, they thought what I thought. Could have been a big, big touched. play. All right, so let's get back to reality here. Ball on the 20-yard line, first and 10, 5.35 to go third quarter. And the give is to the wingman. That's Gar Brown on his first carry of the day. And he goes out of bounds. We have a flag. Yeah, it was a definite face mask. The official on this side didn't spot it, but the back judge did. That's a little wingback counter. I haven't seen him run yet today. They, it is part of their offense, and it's a good play. 
Well, there's a penalty that really hurts. Here it comes. You see the blocking out front. Now watch. Oh my. No question. Oh, that was. That's tough. That's. I'm sure he didn't intentionally do it. It's one of those things that happens trying to get the tackle. Man's coming your way. You've got to try to grab something. Right. First down. He had the first down before the penalty, and you tack that on. They're all the way up to the 46-yard line. Third penalty for Maslin and McKinley. And that committed a foul up to this point. Let's see if McKinley can take advantage of this uh, good play plus a penalty. Go back inside to Percy. He'll pick up three or four. Kind of a dive play. A little trap over the middle. McKinley tries to trap a lot inside. They'll trap you a lot of different ways. And uh, I think, you know, maybe there's a little momentum swing here. I feel that way at least. It's funny what, you know, can happen to cause that. And uh, McKinley definitely with a size advantage, their offensive line versus the Maslin defensive line. And again, same play to Gar Brown. He ran well the first time. Good blocking. Oh, and you could hear that up here. Same play. That wing back kind of good blocking up front. They're just coming off the football like they did that first drive. Knocking them back. As you say, that... Uh, that play they've used before from ground level. It was Terry Brewer, 74, making one of the blocks, and I saw Dean Brown out there as well. Good blocking up front. Hard hitting? <laughs> you heard it yourself. First and ten. Get inside, handoff again. Tough tackle, tough yards. Trap inside, just like the previous play. C.J. Harris, before. nose man. Helping up Percy Snow. Like to see that, the hard hitting, then the sportsmanship helping him up. Oh, There's room for very, both very in this game. Very game in that respect. Hillary Brooks is in for what I believe is the first time in the ball game. A wide receiver spelling Juan Taylor and bringing in the play. Call out again at two, second and eight. Ball on the Maslin 41 yard line. Side hand out, Maslin ready for that one. Well played by Crenshaw. He destroyed that play before it got started. That was an inside wing back counter that time, and he penetrated the line of scrimmage and uh, cut off the running lane. Now, so McKinley facing another third down play. Last time they ran the wing back, and they also got the penalty. So just because it's third and long doesn't necessarily mean a pass in this case, and wholesale substitutions, Perrin, Taylor, and Clax are in. Anthony, Brooks, and Brown are out, and they've taken out the tight end, Mike Smith. Double wing with a wide out. They're gonna run it. Keith Wakefield called it from up here. They're gonna be well short of the first down. They may feel they're in four down territory. This will be interesting. It's gonna be fourth and about Four or five, it looks like, huh? Probably the most important play up to this point. You heard it. Punt the ball. Punt the ball. What they'll try to do is really pin him down deep here. And again, uh, Van Voorhis kicking into the wind. He probably wants height as much as distance on this one. I'm trying to get some coverage downfield. They're going to do that shifting. Almost drew him off. Not quite. We were ready for that. So was the Tigers. Mark, you got to watch that, Mark. Let's see. I think it's going into the end zone. That's not what he wanted to do. No, I'm sure they were hoping to get him inside the 20 somewhere. Maybe kick it out of bounds if possible. So on the change of possession, 2.52 to go. Third quarter, McKinley 7. 2.52 as you see it. Maslin with the ball. First and 10 at their 20. Motion now, and Ziegenthaler back to the top of the screen. Jerry Williams on that hit. It's like that isolation play we've seen inside a number of times. The uh, thing that concerns me here is that in 241, Mass is going to lose the advantage of the win. That's right. That's right. McKinley will have it that entire fourth quarter. And that, that'll be the time when what happened at the coin toss will turn around. Mass with all the advantages early. McKinley will have that win for the fourth quarter. Could be a big factor. We'll, Keep an eye on that for you. Right now it's second and nine. Fabianich back to throw. For the third time that I can remember, and the first time for Maslin, a receiver slips and falls and really messed up the timing. 
Yeah, Sigan Thaler was open on that little out route. He just fell down. Now what do you do here? It's third and long, third and nine. You got the ball in your own 21. A mistake here could be a real killer. Yet you don't want to give up the ball. You've got to get the first down there. You're behind by a point. The wind's at your back. You've got to get the first down. Now he goes to the two wide receivers. Top of your screen, Lekovitz. Straight back to throw. Throwing open is Ziggenthaler, and he can't hold on. Deep curl pattern. He was wide open. Good ball, too. Thrown well. Baby Onich, as I say, having the best game of his season. There's a tight end coming out, as you see. Say two receivers, and he goes for the deeper of the two. Right. They have good protection. He's got all day to throw. It's a little out route and a curl behind, and he is open. He doesn't drop many of these. He's an excellent receiver. Excellent. Back to live action now. The punt and fielding it on his own 39 is Clax. Watch this. Breaks two. Going down the Maslin sideline. Cut it back now. He could go all the way. Kicking game. Big, big play. A 62-yard punt return for Chris Clax, who has done that before. McKinley won a game at Austin Town Fitch based on special teams. And let's watch it again here. The kicking game. Hunting, place kicks, punt returns. Means so much to the game. And we're going to catch the tail end of it here. But he cut to his left, and there was a nice wall, and... Uh, Turn it into six. Important extra point here. Mark Smith. It's up. And it's good. Everybody remember this play. The 62-yard punt return by Clax could be a big one. 155 to go. 14 to 6 now. McKinley leads. And they got that on the board before they get the advantage of the win. So they accomplished two things here. Now both teams have that ability. Special teams to return kicks. Clax averaging 13 yards per return, and that's not his first touchdown on a punt return. He has several on the season. I'd be very surprised if McKinley kicks it all deep. I think they'll do what we call a squib kick and kick it on the ground. They're not going to give Sigenthaler or any of those good backs a chance to return this football. The coaches told me in the pregame show coming true. I know Moronto, the kicking game, very important for him. Special teams play, both teams excellent there. The big play, key mistake, special teams. Sometimes all that overshadows what you do offensively and defensively. It does. It means so much to winning or losing the game. 155 to go. The Bulldogs ready. Mark Smith to kick it off. And again, that squib kick. Fielded by one of the upmen. Has trouble picking it up. That's Crenshaw. And he's down about the 29. Keep in mind, Dwayne Crenshaw was a starting fullback on this team last year. He's used to touching the ball. Sure he is. That's probably why he's in there. Exactly. They play him at that up position because of that. Bulldogs up by eight. Of course, Maslin with a touchdown and two-point conversion can tie. See what they're going to do here. First and ten. Ball in the 29. Give us to Jackson. Percy Snow held his ground. Amazing. He's been on almost every tackle. Because there was some running room there. That was a one-on-one -on -one situation. They're only down by eight points, though. They can obviously get that, so and they'll still run the football. We call this 26. They fake to the fullback and give to the tailback off right tackle. Ankle tackle. Got him on the ground. Second and five now. They still got five yards out of it. Inside one minute to go now. The lights on here at Fawcett Stadium. Maybe on it's back to pass wide open. Pass was complete to Norris. Good effort. I believe he got the first down in the second effort. I think so. Ability to hit the open man. Been a lot of slipping inside, it seems like. Tom McDaniels trying to make a point to one of the officials and to his own players as well. Probably trying to make one of those adjustments we talked about right on the field. First and ten, ball on the 40. 
Fabianich back to throw. Nice play. Well, they're going to call a flag. What do you do? Come over the shoulder. Yeah, it looked like he got him with his left arm as he reached across with his right arm. That's the way it looked from up here, but the official probably play. sure had a better look at it than we did. Maybe we'll see it again. Maybe we Watch can it pick again. it up here. Top of the screen. It looked like he got him with his left arm because he was reaching forward with his right. Can't quite tell. All right. So whether he did or he didn't, the officials called it, which is the key factor. I believe the first penalty on Kent McKinley today. Yes, it is, Mark said it tells me. Could be a costly one. That'll give him a first down at the 45-yard line. And Maslin started on their 20. I wouldn't be surprised to see him throw it here. He'll throw it deep, possibly. Mikhlekovic's in motion. Toss pitch to Jackson, stringing it out. McKinley, Jackson cuts it in, gets a few yards out of it. Keep it on the ground, it looks like. Devon Torrance, Quentin Jackson. First and snow. How many times have we called that number? A busy football player today. Amazes me, the, some of these young men who, who start both offensively and defensively. I know you had a, your quor, a quarterback, Tracy Siri, who did both, and such an outstanding job. We're at the end of three quarters of play. The score, Kent McKinley, 14, and Maslin, 6. Ready to go now with the final quarter of action, save for overtime. You've got to mention that. This would be the first one ever. Could happen. Mathematically, certainly, it could happen at this point. But for Maslin, they need to get in. And remember, with the win in their faces, the possibility of field goals goes down. Inside handoff to Jackson, and he breaks a couple tackles. A great individual effort. They hit him at the line of scrimmage, and he drugged that tackle for about five yards. Just a straight dive play over the right guard. That was Tom Whitfield, the nose man, that uh, was on his back. But the just strength. Just straight Jackson. dive. Watch this. That's the termination in it. Great individual effort by number eight, Cornell Jackson. 11 minutes, 30 seconds to go in the game. 14 to six, McKinley. Third down, one yard to go for the Tigers. They've got the first down and more. McKinley's angling field, and they've mixed it up well. They just ran back against the green. Norris with a quick hitter over the right guard. All right, Norris the ball carrier, Percy Snow on the tackle. Power football here. Quick hitter. Straight dive. It's probably where they've got their best yardage. They try to want to slow down Jerome Perry, and you see him come in quickly, and they went, ran right by him, maybe try to slow his pursuit a little bit. Fabianich on first down. The handoff to Jackson. Initial hit by Snow, but this time Jackson, the winner in that individual battle. He's just carrying people. He's showing some great determination carrying the football. I think he's getting stronger as the game goes on. Bring out a second and five call, and of course here you, hey, you could go for the first down, you could go for more. And it was in between downs. Let's see how Maslin's going to play it. Got both their wide receivers in there, although Ziegenthaler is lining up pretty tight. Actually tight end position, double tight end. Oh, great play to Jackson, and he's into the secondary. All the way down to the 10. McKinley changed their defense. They jumped into a double eagle look, and uh, their down people just turned the tackles out, and there was a big hole inside. Developing story of this game, the Maslin offensive line and the runs of that man, number eight. That's how the players see it. They trapped it. Yes, sir, they trapped it with the left guard. Quick hitter. Excellent play. First down and 10 with the ball on the 11. They could get a first down at the one. Pitches to Jackson, and he slipped. That was part of it. We've seen a lot of that today. More and more. This game rolls along. Our first man down. We have an official's timeout for an injury. If he hadn't slipped, he'd got close. No yeah. question. That's Gary Little, number 37, the man down. He was shaking him. Shaking up right at the end of St. Joe's game. We'll check his progress. We'll be back. The score, 14-6. Kent McKinley leads. 
Gary Little, defensive back for McKinley, is up, and he appears to be okay. Gary was shaken up at the end of the St. Joseph game last week, but he was fine. I talked to him on the way back and from Cleveland, and uh, he was fine. And he looked okay right here, and that's good to see. Twenty thousand one hundred sixty-four, I think they said. Just over twenty thousand here. That's what we waited the official attendance. Now back to the game action. Second and six with the ball on the seven. Tigers driving, trying to tie this one up. Inside handoff to North. Student body up the center. I believe they just base blocked it. Man on man, it looked like it just straight ahead. They had a good offensive surge on that one. They can get a first down. It looks like possibly on about the two foot line. That's exactly right. They can get first down inside the one. Third down and two. This is where football gets down and basic in the trenches. The line play will be oh so important. From the vantage point of the McKinley defense. Pitches to Jackson outside. Breaks one tackle and down. Great hitting there. I saw Dave Williams get up. I saw Quentin Jackson get up. Great effort on Williams's part. Great effort to make the stop. Let's see it now. We'll give credit where credit is due on the replay here from the McKinley defensive side of things. And Kent McKinley's taking a timeout. It was Williams Dave Williams. A great play. He took great on the blocker position. and made the tackle. Can't do much better than that. The setup is fourth and two, 8.38 to go in the game. McKinley 14, Massillon six, and McKinley has called a timeout. And obviously, Massillon's gonna go for six at this point. We, we talked about three or four big plays in the game. I'd say this is one of them right now. 20,174 is the attendance. 20,000 people at a high school football game. Not too bad. They love it, don't they? No question. Cornell Jackson has really done a job on the ground. Mark and Zeta telling me 18 carries, 70 yards. That will probably make him the leading ball carrier in the game, both in terms of attempts and total yardage. And of course, he's been so instrumental on this drive. He's run with great determination, refusing to give up. Coming back from that injury must be... You know, he had uh, say 70 yards today, thanks in large part to the injuries. He came into this ball game with 176 on the season. Again, because he missed you know, six, seven games, just right at the end of the season. In fact, he came back for the uh, St. Joseph game. That was his first action. Right. All right, fourth and two. What do you do here, coach? I would think some type of... I don't know, option, pass, run, or unless they feel they can just run the ball straight at them. But I don't know. I think it's going to be one or the other, either power football, or they'll try to bring it outside and have a couple options to go to. Let's see it. Going to let this play speak for itself. They didn't make it. They decided to go for the power football. No way, I don't think. They'll probably measure it. He may not even measure it. There's no way he made that. No, he didn't get it. Let's look at it, coach. They just run a base dive. Nose man made the Gary play. Gary Brown filled that hole. Came right off the center's block and made the tackle. Great individual play. And Gary Brown had nose tackle, 169 pounds. He's extremely quick. Extremely quick. Now... <laughs> the field position becomes the key. McKinley, first down and 10 at their own two. Eight minutes, 13 seconds to go in the ball game. Full house backfield. Masson must keep him here. Look at, look at that. Percy Snow. Eight yards on a play that looked like it was stopped at the line of scrimmage. Great personal effort. And how about gaining eight yards on first down from that position? Oh boy, Percy Snow could be injured on the play. Let's take a look. He's holding his leg. Could be a cramp, possibly. Hopefully, that's all it is. I believe the way he grabbed his calf, that could be. See how quiet it got all of a sudden? 
you know, the effort that Percy Snow has put out here. He needs a lot There'll be an injury team. timeout with 7.46 to go. Kent McKinley leading Maslin. The score 14 to 6. We'll be back. Percy Snow is up and appears to be just fine, thank you. I'm almost sure it was a cramp the way they were working on it. As you said, Coach, during that uh, timeout, Maslin holds them there. They can get the ball back in good field position. That first run hurt. Now they only need two, second and two. And I would assume they're going to keep it right on the ground in this position. They're trying to do two things, not only move the ball out of a hole, but also eat up that clock, which is now down to seven minutes, 40 seconds and counting in the game. McKinley with an eight-point lead. He had the first down, Dave Williams. Dave Williams, the young man that came in to spell Percy Snow. There you see the McKinley depth. Oh, there's so many fine athletes. And to be a playoff team in, in Division I football, you've got to have depth. They're going to continue on. Jerome Perrin brings in the play. He replaces Benny Anthony. And they're going to give you that full house backfield look. Dave Williams. Just Woody Hayes football. That's right. right. Full back, off tackle. Strength versus strength. Now the PA announcer says second and eight. The scoreboard says second and seven. We can tell you that the ball is on the 17-yard line. We can tell you that those are the McKinley cheerleaders. Again, showing you that full house backfield with Clax, Anthony, and Dave Williams. And Juan Taylor. Had a little motion oh, started. Yeah. A little start early. It could be costly. There's still plenty of time. Masson can get the ball back. Second penalty on McKinley in the ball game. Dead ball, false start. Two. No, second and 12 now with the ball on the 12-yard line. And six minutes and 30 seconds to go in the game. McKinley 14, Maslin 6. There you see the Maslin coaching staff. Got to hold him here from the Maslin perspective. Got to get that ball back. From the McKinley perspective, eat up the clock. Cheney goes back to throw. Open as Taylor catches it. Went out of bounds by Myrick. Now that was a pass, but it was a good, safe pass quick out, and I'm sure if he's covered, he'd have thrown it out of bounds. The only thing that does, obviously, it stops the clock, and, and that is a massive favor at this point. And the replay? Quick out for Taylor. He's got great hands, no question. Good protection by the uh, McKinley offensive line on that one, too. Excellent. Jerome! Stay in there! Okay, in with the play. They're yelling, no, Jerome, from the McKinley sidelines. They may have Time out. Uh, Too many players on the field. I was going to say. <laughs> you heard it from the sideline. No, Jerome, no. And it's going to cost McKinley a timeout, and we're going to pause with 6.12 to go. McKinley 14, Maslin 6. Back here at Fawcett Stadium, 14 to six, Kent McKinley leads Maslin. and there's head coach Tom McDaniels. And a little powwow on the sidelines, and here's the call, it's third and five with the ball in the 19. Cheney will go back to pass. Flax over the middle, he'll be short of the first down. <laughs> Gonna have to give up the football. Saw the tight end breaking out here to the bottom of the screen. But again, just like Maslin, McKinley does not throw much to the tight end. He's in there for blocking. I guess that surprises me to see the ball over the middle, though. Yeah, with two defenders right there. The and, uh, see Chris Clark coming off the field. Man, in the spotlight now, Van Forrest with the wind at his back. Not bad. Let's see what kind of a roll it's going to take. 
Going to kick back. Center. To the own down to. I'll tell you, Maslin's got good field position. I think Van Voorhis probably won a little more on that one. Yeah, no question. That wasn't one of his better efforts. End over end kick. And now, that confrontation. Maslin offense. McKinley defense. Ball on the 45-yard line. Five and a half minutes to go in the game. McKinley leads by eight. Baby Onich is the quarterback. Putting Norris on a wing to the top of the screen. Actually more like a tight end in this formation. Back to throw. Paul Fabianich. Pressure by Jerome Perrin. And the ball is intercepted. The ball is intercepted. I think that Gary Little was injured earlier. And he sure came back. Excellent coverage. The same route they ran earlier in the second quarter. To go curl, the deep curl to Sagan Taylor. And he stepped right in front of it. Good defensive play. See the protection. See the pressure by Perrin. Little steps right in front. Big, big play there. All right, McKinley with another chance now to eat up some of this clock. We're under five minutes to go. Bulldogs with an eight-point lead. To the up back, Percy Snow back in the ball game, and he's out to the 49-yard line. I think they're going to see a lot of him the rest of this game. Right. Pick up a five, second and five. Malele bringing in the play. Juan Taylor. This play may be McKinley Power football here. Here's our strength. You try to stop it. Oh, I know. Oh, I bet you Tom McDaniels has a fit on play. It's just like Keith Wakefield would on a play like that. Yeah, Hand that off, and they got it all mixed up. The ball could have easily been dropped. They ran right into each other as it came to hand the ball off. It's going to be in isolation again. They're just going to feed it to them inside, it looks like. Run the ball in between the tackles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you can see it. They just collide in the backfield. Oh, my. And look, at, look, at the, look at the ball there for a split second. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Carter had him, and that ball you could see just slightly, slightly come loose there for a split second. Now you see a rather disgusted head coach Tucker McCain. All right, big play now. Third down and six. 3.45 in the clock rolling. Let's see what the play call is. Give it to Perrin. Perrin's got Brewer out in front of him. I think he's got the first down, although he does go out of bounds. I believe he does. That's that wing back counter oh. machine. Could be a best play, maybe. I think it's been their most successful play of the second half. Big first down. Here we'll see it again. He hands off to Pear. He pull the backside guard, gets a nice block on my Brewer. There's Brewer, number 74, Terry Brewer. He's battled the injury bug at times during the season. Both teams have gone with basically, though, they're starting five all season long in the offensive line. And you've seen the improvement week by week. Jerome Perrin trying to get off the field now. Time for the snap. He does on a first down play. Power football to Snow. Just dive over the left guard. See him cradle that with both arms. <laughs> you know, some of the Maslin faithful begin to leave. I don't think it's that time yet. No, anything could happen at this point. Here we'll see it. Just straight dive over the left guard. Good play by Purdue. Dave Williams in. Dean Brown's coming out of the lineup here. Along with Chris Clack. Dave Ellenberger, number 61, is in. I think Dean may be uh, shaking up just a little bit, although he came out under his own power. This is a second and eight call. 2.55 left in the game. Snow. Jared Vance has him wrapped in. Swank finishes it off. It's that isolation play we've seen most of the evening. Out of T back to give the ball to the fullback. Masson's going to call a timeout, and why not? This uh, one play, this is much as the Clax punt return coming up could be the key. They've got to get the ball back from the Masson perspective, and here's Percy Snow running hard inside. Harder. It's really Vance that has him, as you can see. Good defense by Masson. Ball squirts out a little bit late there. 
Yeah, set it up for you. Third and six. The ball is on the Maslin 41-yard line. 2.37 to go in the ball game. And McKinley holding on to a 14-6 lead. Both teams on in the first quarter. Quick put up a touchdown. McKinley leading 7-6. And it's the defensive swing of things and the big play. The Flax punt return. So we've had a little bit of everything. Special teams, the offense early in the ball game, and of course the defense reflected on the number of points on the scoreboard. When you think back now in hindsight, it all fits in. It all flows together in a game like this. No question. I think at any time, any time these two teams play, it, it, it boils down to a physical, hard-hitting defensive football game. Not a lot of points. There are a few people leaving Foster Stadium, but a piece of advice for you at home. We aren't done yet. We'll have the winning coach on uh, post-game show and we'll get the reactions of head coach Keith Wakefield to Perry and <laughs> this one still has a long way to go but this will be a real key play here third and six double wing Cheney's gonna throw it downfield the man's open Taylor he's got the ball inside the 10 to the 5 touchdown Pitt McKinley Lined up in that wing that they've been pitching the ball to. What a play that. call. Good call. No question about it. Master didn't expect it. I don't think too many of us expected it. Let's see it again. From the 40. Drops back. Kill around the sideline. It's a good call. If the ball's overthrown and incomplete, they can punt the football away. If He'll break caught, a tackle, too, to get it in. If it's caught, it's a touchdown. Good call. That could be the icing on the cake right there. Mark Smith now in to try the extra point. And that one's no good. And there's a flag now down. I think we've got a roughing the kicker, I believe. Possibly. I think you're right, because I think they're going to do it again. Let's see. Yes, that's the call. Well, that's one of those things, when it rains, it pours. You know, that momentum that we talk about. Oh, what a call that, that play. <laughs> yeah, take it in half the distance. Of course, now the question, I've seen a lot of the coaches. Retry the try. All right, Fred Vicarell. Sometimes you want to go for two. In this situation, I think, uh, take the point. Right. Take the sure one. And a kicker like uh, Mark Smith. 21 out of 25 now. 22 out of 26. Exactly two minutes and 30 seconds to go. McKinley's in control of this one. 21-6, and we can use that term for the first time. And now it's the big play. Now it's the Clacks punt return and the touchdown pass to Taylor. Like we said earlier, three or four big plays in any tight game. That's what's going to happen. Going to see the pass again. Taylor is wide open. Lectovic just can't quite get him down. Now well, Juan Taylor making his presence felt. The Bulldogs' leading receiver. A lot of teams try to take him out of the offense. That's where Jerome Perrin's come in the last two weeks. And they got the ball. And again, it was a a different type of formation, I think, as you pointed out, Coach, that was the key to that play. Yeah, they had been sweeping the ball with snow into the short side out formation all day. I'd say three or four times. Maybe Masson thought that again, expected it. I'm sure they didn't expect him to throw the football. Now yeah, they set it up now, save for a miracle. <laughs> Miracles do happen. We've seen it. McKinley will finish the season 9-1, and one, be number one in the region. It'll be a playoff game here at Fawcett Stadium next Saturday night. After that... It's up to the Ohio High School Athletic Association and the computer. Right now, it's up to Wes Ziggenthaler to bring back this kick from his own two-yard line, and he's coming right up the center. And he crosses the 25, and the ball will be spotted about the 26-yard line. Devon Torrens gets up off the pile. Kerry Brown. Now you got to air it out now. They have to. Wind's in their face, too. It's, not, uh, it's died down some, though, so it's probably not quite the factor. Ziggenthaler does the smart thing. He'll take it right up the middle and serve all the time he can, get as much yardage. That hit really Tom Whitfield along with Devon Torrance. 
Savionich back to throw. Got time. Runs out of the pocket. Throws on the run. He gets Agater, the tight end. He wanted, yes, to, he wanted to go to the curl for the split receiver, but he was covered. Kinley's now in a 4-3 defense. More of a prevent type defense. And that means Devon Torrance, number 45, comes in. They'll take out one of their defensive tackles. That's a look we've seen. And we are down inside two minutes to play. I think it what? Time off for a measurement, I believe. The way they're looking out on the far sideline. Just inches short. Actually, the big advantage is it stops the clock and gives Maslin the time to get set. All right, now the two-minute drill comes into effect here. Yeah, I'm sure we'll see their two-minute offense. They need to score very quickly, and then uh, probably looking at the onside kick, but McKinley defense has been so tough, so tough. And that may be second in inches, but I know the Tigers are looking for more. I'm sure the Bulldogs are aware of that fact as well. And what do they do? They toss it. He did not make the first down. No. Lost yardage. And the clock runs. Now it didn't fool McKinley, that's for sure. And that'll bring up a third and two. Here we see it. Just a quick pitch to Norris. Good defense. Good defense. That kills him. I'm surprised we haven't seen him in a two-minute O. And we're now down to 120. And Fabianich back to throw. Rolls it out. Man is open. The short man, Norris, but he's stuck in the center of the field. I think on that sweep, I suppose they want to try to get the first down and get out of bounds. Exactly. I'm sure that was their thinking. And now they complete the pass. They get the first down. I'm hearing timeout uh, for a measurement. Now this is a, this is well and good if you're trying to go down to tie things up or go ahead, but they need two scores now. And sooner or later you know they're going to have to air it out deep. They're down by 15. They can't wait any longer. Coach McDaniel. John Moranto is inside the huddle for the uh, Maslin Tigers now, talking to Fabianich. See the assistant coaches in there. And Kent McKinley. It's John Johnson, the defense I was, coordinator. I thought it was John. You know you're in trouble, coach, when you have the glasses on. They have a nice single shot. You still can't identify them. Boy, <laughs> the eyes are going. The eyes may have it, but they're going. <laughs> you know whose sideline that is. I'd say those people are a little excited. Yeah, just a bit. Just a tad. Yeah, and they'll go home, and, and with the, our replay starting at 7, they can see themselves now tomorrow night. Yeah, well, there's another one you don't like to see from the McKinley perspective. Uh, you know what they have to do, and they jump off sides. Now, they're anxious. I'm sure they're yes. in that pass rush technique. They're coming after them. Now, despite that, a uh, number of penalties. Let's see, that's three now for McKinley, 25 yards. How many do we have for Maslin, Mark and Zeta? Three, <laughs> for 25 yards. Game that's this big, that's excellent. Both from an official standpoint, letting him play, and from the team standpoint. Back to throw, Fabianich. Two men out to this side. The defender slips down, so does Ziggenthaler, but he does have the ball, and he's at about the 43-yard line of Kent McKinley. And he gets out of bounds. Just an out route and a flag by Lektovic. You see it again here. They're in a twins formation. Twins right strong. There's Sigan Thaler on the out. You can't see Lektovich, but he's going deep on a flag route. Now we're down to 106. The clock has stopped. Maslin needs six, and they need it quick. I don't think we should be 
They had good coverage on that last one. Fabiani scrambled, got out of bounds. One of the fans, uh, the reason we're pausing here, take a look at the replay first. Here we go, they're covered. He tucks it and runs. Good hit, he played with the quarterback, getting out of bounds. Play took eight seconds off the clock, down to 58 seconds. Someone has taken L down in front of the press box. That's why uh, he didn't hear much from us. The paramedic is on the way. Back to throw, Paul Fabianich. Looking down and almost intercepted. I guess who? Gary Little. He's the one that had the big pickoff. That would have been a big, big play if he could have caught that one. That was a tight end on a deep drag route coming across the middle. Tom McDaniel saying, get the hands up, get the hands up from ground level. And we'll see it. Straight drop back. Tight end right there. I think they've thrown more to their tight end today than any game this season. Now you've got uh, Letkovitz about a mile outside of the top of the screen. You can't even hardly see him. To the bottom is Ziegenthaler breaking over the middle of the tight end Richardson. Scrambling now is Fabianich. He throws downfield. This is going to be picked off, and that'll be the ball game. And that is Juan Taylor. And Juan Taylor, they said, uh, we're going to play Juan basically on offense, but in a big game, they put him in defensively. Met the icing on the cake. He was at free safety. He stepped right in front of that post route. Intercepted the football. So Juan Taylor, who caught the last touchdown pass. Here we can see it again from the ground level. Big Anich is scrambling. His receivers are covered. Siggy Taylor comes back across now, comes back to the ball. There's the interception. Not much Danny will just go back and fall on it. We're down to 40 seconds. I'm curious to see if Maslin calls timeout. This is one of those things where, why? Why do it? Yeah, in this situation, it's, uh, it's a point of frustration, I'm sure, for the Madison coaches and team. Yeah. Not much you can do about it. No. Nope. I think it's best just to let that clock run out. There's the bulldog. <laughs> yep, on this day, that's, uh, that's right. For McKinley, there'll be another day. And this will be the last day and the last play of the 1985 mckinley Maslin football game. This game is history. The final score, Kent McKinley 21 and Maslin 6. There's your final score. Kent McKinley, 21, the Maslin Tigers, 6. In just a moment, we'll be going down to the field where hopefully head coach Keith Wakefield and I can talk to the winning head coach, Tom McDaniels. We'll keep it up here and wait for our director, Sherwood Shoemaker, to give us the cue that we're all set to go. Coach, the big play certainly marked the second half, and the big plays belong to Kent McKinley. Yeah, the, the punt return was obviously the turnaround. Uh, the momentum uh, had swung a little bit to Maslin's favor, but the, the punt return by Clax was the big, big play of the game. For Camp McKinley, it'll be a date next Saturday, probably at Fawcett Stadium. All that will be announced on Sunday. And for the Maslin Tigers of head coach John Moranto, it's got to be uh, a disappointment. But on the plus side, here's Chris Clax going into the end zone. This is the end of the punt return, 62 yards in length. That may have been the key play, just like Clax's long 80-yard run was a year ago. Yeah, I think so. You know, again, the, the momentum in a game like this and, and the emotions fly so high, and that, that really takes a lot of the starch out of the opposing team when they make a big, big play like that in a kicking game. All right, unfortunately, it looks like we have some uh, technical problems, and head coach McDaniels does want to get into the locker room with his players. We'll see what we can do. We'll just kind of hold it here until we get a final uh, view on this game. Mark and Zeta quickly working on the unofficial final stats, and until you've done a job like that, it's tough to uh, tough to figure out all this, everything coming to a head right at the end of the ball game. But where it counts, the re the real uh, important statistic is the 21 to six win for Kent McKinley. That's all they care about. That's right. That's the only stat that counts. When push comes to shove, that's definitely the only stat that counts. 